So first of all, hello and welcome to uh, Citizens for Global Solutions Virtual Book Club. Today is Saturday, November the 11th. Um, I'm today's moderator, James May. I'm CGS Program Officer. So uh, Drea is monitoring the chat today. So please don't hesitate to reach out to her or post questions in the general chat. Um, Drea will also be available to help with tech support if any of you get into difficulty. So uh, of course, today's author is uh, Manu Bhagavan. I'll give him a more comprehensive introdu introduction a little bit later after housekeeping. So we're recording today's session and it will be available on CGS's YouTube uh, channel by the middle of next week. Um, if it's anybody's first time to Book Club, I'd like to say a big welcome. Uh, today's the third session of four of this book. If you haven't been keeping up to date, the book is Peacekeepers, India and the Quest for One World, and we're really pleased to have you all to join us. So, uh, just to make sure there's enough time for everybody to ask questions, I'm going to ask for a community agreement that you keep your questions and comments to two or less minutes. If you go over that, I'll interject and remind you to keep to the time limit so that everybody has an opportunity to speak. I'm also going to ask you to limit yourself to just one question per person or one comment per person. As I said, we want to ensure that everyone has an opportunity to engage with Manu, yeah. uh, our author today. Thank you. Does anybody object to that? Good. Okay. Um, okay. The schedule will remain the same as last time. Manu will kick us off with his, his thoughts um, on the chapter covered by today's session. We'll then open up for questions at about 12.30. Uh, that's EST. You can raise your virtual or physical hand um, to put questions forward once we get to the question period. Um, or you can put your questions in the chat box at any time and uh, Drea will monitor them. Um, We'll stop about 10 minutes before the end of the session. That's about 1.20. Um, for any announcements that you might have, I would ask you to keep any announcements on other topics for then, um, and they'll be welcome. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today uh, and the author of our great book, Manu Bhagavan. Manu is a, history, a professor of history, human rights, and public policy at Hunter College and the Graduate Center at the City um, University of New York, where he's also a senior fellow at the Ralph Bunch Institute for International Studies. He's the author and editor of seven books. Manu, I would be glad if you would give a plug for your upcoming book. We heard a bit about it in the previous session, but keep reminding people because it's coming up for, uh, for is, it, is it open now or is it published soon? You'll have to inform us. Um, I know we're all looking forward to it. Uh, Drea will put Manu's uh, website uh, and Twitter handle in the comments. That's at Manu Bhagavan on Twitter and magobhagavan.com for any of you who are interested. Today is the third session of Manu's book, The Peacemakers. So I'd now like to hand over to Manu uh, to give us the highlights and insights from chapter five, which we've been covering this month. Manu, take it away. Um, thank you, James, and good afternoon to everyone, or good morning to some of you, I guess, uh, in different time zones. Um, let me first say, I just, I think I said this in part the last time, but with each session, I just find it more remarkable. I'd like to thank you all for this incredible dedication and commitment to coming to repeated sessions to hear me sort of drone on about uh, the same, the same book and the relatively speaking, the same topic um, month after month. And I, I hope uh, each time we have something new to talk about and say, um, and that you've continue to find this interesting. Um, so in the first session, I think we just tried to talk broadly about what the book was about and uh, how I sort of came to writing it. Um, and in the second session, we were a bit more focused on um, some of the initial forays and um, uh, the South Africa question and such things. Um, today's chapter, chapter five, is the most India specific. Um, and so in a sense, it might feel the most distant for some of you. Um, so what I'm going to try to do is contextualize it in 
a way that I think might um, uh, make it more relevant to some of our broader concerns. Um, first of all, let me just uh, shout out to David Gallup, uh, who uh, isn't feeling well. He's here um, as a trooper, but um, just thinking about you and hope you feel better soon. Uh, and uh, let me also just acknowledge the incredible difficulties that our world is facing um, and that um, innocent people around the world are facing being subjected to um, horrific um, circumstances of military uh, conflict. And we send our thoughts to them and would like to do our best to resolve those things as soon as possible. Um, I thought I'd start that way because uh, I think the book I've written, or when we talk about someone like a Gandhi uh, in general, um, we perhaps immediately lean into the idea that these things are very idealistic. And when advocating for um, certain kinds of solutions, including the solutions discussed in the book, and obviously for things that um, uh, the Center for Global Solutions also believes in and stands for and advocates for, um, those things can seem increasingly difficult and distant to achieve in uh, a world such as ours and in the position that it's in right now and in the continued, say, steps backwards that it continues to take. Um, so in that sense, I think the chapter that we're talking about today, chapter five, is really important. And it's important because unlike much of the rest of the book, this is, this is a chapter that focuses in on a lot of what we might call realpolitik, reality in short. Uh, and there's a lot of horror in this chapter. Um, the three big things are, uh, generally speaking, the partition. Uh, secondly, the violence associated with partition and the gruesome statistics associated with that. Uh, and thirdly, the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi. So there are three big things which intrude on any kind of idealistic vision, I think. Um, and it is the reality of the world we live in, and it is the reality of um, the counter politics, or shall we say that the nature of politics uh, in which any kind of idealistic vision needs to operate. So I think that's a good place to begin, um, which is, uh, let's first, just take note of the fact that um, the lead protagonists of this book, Jawaharlal Nehru, India's first prime minister, Mahatma Gandhi, um, who I presume everyone knows, and Nehru's sister, Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, she's sort of not really present so much in this chapter, uh, that, they, that these three advocates are trying to achieve something uh, and they're trying to achieve it in a clear-eyed fashion. That is that they 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 don't have a Pollyanna-ish approach. Everything is not just fine. Everything will not just go swimmingly. That there, that there is a reality of opposition and that there is a reality of people willing to take uh, steps that these three people might not be, but that they have to figure out a way to deal with that, uh, which, which can take things really in the wrong direction. Um, so let's just, let me try and clarify some of the things in this chapter for you that perhaps might be confusing. When we think about colonial India, uh, many of us might assume that there was the British in India and that's all that there was. Uh, but in fact, there were 600 semi-autonomous regions, which were called princely states. These princely states really uh, ranged in size, power, and prestige. 
Some of these states were as wealthy as a European state. Uh, some of them, uh, the, the monarchs um, were so wealthy that they uh, were able to fund uh, certain kinds of major events or policy pushes even in Europe. They were also kind of fantastic in their in the way that they would show off. Some of them had, for example, uh, it's been a while since I thought of this, but I think it's things like George Washington's clock and um, um, the Napoleon's pearls that belonged to Napoleon, things like this, found their ways over to the Indian princes, the wealthiest ones. Um, on the lower range of this group, there were like landlords. Uh, and so some the, the upper ones had titles, gun salutes, palaces, Rolls Royces, uh, things like this. And the lower the lower tier of the, of the category uh, were just merely landlords is a good way to think about it. Uh, there were 600 of them. Um, and some of the most famous and prominent include the princely state of Kashmir, the princely state of Hyderabad. That's the largest one in the center. That's the top most prestigious one. And then there were smaller ones that perhaps none of you have ever heard of, like this tiny little one in the West called Junagadh. These three states are particularly important because these three don't follow along with the normal pattern at this particular time. So the princely states are a problem because each of them are ruled by a monarch. They're called princely states as opposed to kingdoms because after the rebellion of 1857, uh, there's a proclamation by Queen Victoria and she reorganizes, she meaning the British government, reorganizes the relationship and all Indian royalty are called princes in relation to the British crown. So that's not to not to uh, confuse uh, the ranking order. And then everything is kind of ranked in a kind of feudalistic uh, way. Um, so uh, at the time of the approach of independence, these princely states, the status of them was going to, was quite unclear. And some of the princes who were very wealthy and powerful believed that their states should become independent. They, they were not interested in joining uh, either India or Pakistan. To the extent that that was going to be something that was going to happen, they wanted to maintain maximum autonomy and they wanted to things to continue in the way that they had been. So part of this chapter is about uh, the way in which Nehru outmaneuvered them as they were um, preparing to enter the constituent assembly. The princes were represented by an organization called the Chamber of Princes. Uh, and so that's the um, representational body, which is um, deciding the fate of the princes at the national level. So they have this conversation, uh, they have a meeting on, in terms of how they're going to decide whether to enter the constituent assembly. The constituent assembly is a body that's going to be created in order to um, draft a new constitution for the country uh, and transition from the colonial to the post-colonial state. And um, the Muslim League, which is uh, a body represented by Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Boy, the more I'm talking about it, the more I realize that this is just, there's a lot of stuff here, it's quite confusing. So I hope I'm being as clear as I can about it. Muhammad Ali Jinnah uh, was the head of the Muslim League. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but they decided not to participate in the Constituent Assembly. Uh, so the first part of the chapter at any rate is about this, uh, this debate about what happens and Nehru outmaneuvering the representative of the chamber and all of the other princes, Hamidullah of Bhopal, um, and basically convincing them that they should in fact participate, which they do. Um, okay, so why this is important hmm, for, I think, the things that we're talking about is 600 princely states, some of them very tiny, some of them insignificant, some of them rich and powerful. Many of these princes were quite delusional. Many of them were autocratic despots. Many of them were uh, wannabe tin pot dictators. Some of them were progressive. Some of them were democratic. Some of them were great champions of the poor. Uh, so it's a, it's a disparate lot. And what Nehru has to manage, Nehru and his team and his associates have to manage is, how do you bring people of such divergent opinions together 
at the table? How do you create union out of such um, forces determined to pull apart in different directions, such diffuse uh, agents? Uh, and so um, I think this, it, what I the term I use in the chapter is an isomorph, isomorphic mirror. Uh, it, it's a real reflection of what's going on in the larger world. How do you bring people together? How do you talk about unionization uh, in the face of such kinds of fissures? Um, okay, so that's that's one fissure uh, that the book is talking about and the attempts to overcome it. The other is the one that isn't quite overcome isn't really overcome, isn't overcome at all. And that's the increasing fissure between Hindus and Muslims on religious grounds in the subcontinent. Um, and then in the ultimate breakup of the subcontinent into two new post-colonial countries, India and Pakistan. So the lead force for Pakistan is this organization called the Muslim League. The Muslim League is led by this person named Muhammad Ali Jinnah. You might be familiar with him if you've ever seen the Richard Attenborough film Gandhi. Um, that um, film, while it is fantastic uh, in many ways, um, and the, port the acting portrayal of Jinnah is quite amazing by the actor Alec Padamsi, um, Jinnah is not portrayed all that well. He's the villain of the movie um, and down all the way down to the particular way his hair is styled with the white streak and the monocle. I mean, he's kind of a classic Hollywood villain um, in terms of the depiction in that film. That's a little bit, um, um, it's a little bit far from some of the reality of it. Uh, Jinna was a very complex character. And so, uh, the classic view was that he was advocating for something called Pakistan, and he wanted the breakup of India into these into this separate country. Um, but we know now that that isn't really um, quite true. Um, that he wanted, um, he was using the term Pakistan. It was true, but for him, Pakistan was a balance with something he called Hindustan, and. Pakistan would have Hindus in it, and Hindustan would have Muslims in it. And these two units together, Pakistan and Hindustan, for Jinnah together would make up India. And so he wasn't after the breakup of India. Instead, what he was after was the elimination of the category of the minority. And, and uh, Muslims were the largest minority, and so he wanted to dissolve the category of the minority and protect them in this way. In a sense, then, Jinnah's vision was also what we would call a post-liberal vision. It was something that was uh, uh, quite mm, unique. We can, there are all kinds of issues about that people can debate about it. For example, what about other categories of minorities like Sikhs or Jains or Buddhists, and also non-religious categories of minorities, for example. But at any rate, this was what he was actually talking about. Much like Nehru's internationalist vision, Jinnah was playing this close to his chest. Most people didn't understand. Uh, Mountbatten, uh, the British viceroy, um, particularly was very keen on pushing the British plan um, uh, forward. Uh, and when uh, he could not get Jinnah to agree to certain kinds of conditions, he called Jinnah in and Jinnah said, I don't want, this is, right prior to the partition. He says, I don't want your moth eaten Pakistan. He says, Mount Ban says, you'll lose Pakistan then probably for good. And Jinnah uh, says, that's okay. But then Mount Batten goes on the air the next day and announces Pakistan. So anyway, a uh, complicated set of explanations for we get partition um, and we get two separate countries. Uh, and um, uh, the thing that Jinnah conceptualized as Hindustan gets the name India. This is a point which has some political traction today because uh, the current government uh, is pushing back on the idea that this country should be called India. The current government of India is pushing back on the idea that the country should be called India. They instead want the country to be called Bharat, which is an older Hindu name for the place. 
Of course, this is a great irony because Jinnah always felt that this place should not be called India, that it was unfair to call it India, and that Hindustan or Bharat, fine, either one of those is fine, uh, because the entire region was India, not just this one place. So it's a, it's a, uh, there's some things there we can talk about if you'd be interested. Uh, at any rate, the partition uh, is sealed um, and tensions, regardless of whatever these elite politicians are thinking about, uh, tensions are flared between the communities pushed by some additional political figures. So one of the things the book talks about is Gandhi's finest hour. Uh, this is when the Mahatma, who by that point had been relegated to the margins and many people had concluded he was well past his prime and quite senile, uh, and he really wasn't taken very seriously by this point. He suddenly kind of emerges on the stage even bigger than before and clearly as sharp as ever. Uh, and um, he he comes in and he sort of strides into the middle of the violence in Calcutta. The book talks about this. The chapter talks about this. Um, and virtually, it's not really virtually, I mean, actually single-handedly stops the violence uh, in Calcutta. Uh, these are the great Calcutta killings. And then a few months later, he does the same in Delhi. Um, and uh, together, he basically helps to stop uh, the bleeding, um, which is leading up to the partition. Um, uh, and of course, things continue. Uh, thing, things are bad uh, uh, thereafter, too. And um, Gandhi, for quite a while, is very despondent. Um, and he hopes to lead a peace march to Pakistan. And while he's thinking and talking about that, he's assassinated by a Hindu right-wing fundamentalist uh, named Nathuram Godse. And I guess this is also important because uh, the mm, Nathuram Godse's movement, what he belonged to, uh, was a set of um, interrelated organizations, one of which, uh, well, one of one one which also uh, seemed to have some kind of correlative interest in his work um, was an organization called the RSS, um, the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, the RSS, uh, and um, there's another organization as well. At any rate, there's there's a couple people who are involved with that. The point is is that. Uh, the RSS was banned after Gandhi was assassinated. It was banned for a number of years. Eventually, it was uh, the ban was lifted and they were allowed to re-enter politics. And the point of all of this is to say that the current government of India, including the current prime minister, uh, have um, ideological roots in the RSS and they trace their, their, uh, their vision back to that organization uh, and uh, at which they see as a service organization, uh, and uh, that they also um, have roots uh, that that connect to some of this. And the current prime minister, I think, can also be seen sometimes uh, admiring um, some of the people who were um, at least in the inner sphere of some of these events, including a man named Veer Savarkar. Okay, so that's um, that's the a lot of India stuff here, as opposed to the stuff we've normally been talking about. Um, it's in that context that uh, Nehru is uh, Nehru and his agents are still talking about one world, and they're pushing this through, uh, and they kind of quick continuously cor like they try to correspond what is happening in with state making in India. The point of this chapter is that there is a correspondence between state making and domestic affairs and the international. So on the one hand, uh, at, a micro, at a micro level, what's happening in this period is India in, in what becomes India, all these mm, different views and ideas who want, wish to go in a lot of different directions are sort of corralled by Nehru and brought together. And he's very explicit about this. He talks about this in the context of the Federalist Papers. Uh, in the United States and essentially kind of indicating that what he's after is a United States of India. Um, different states were going to come together and then uh, be under kind of a federalized structure. World federalism in that sense, from Nehru's point of view, should be understood as uh, kind of a loose, like, you know, the, the, the nature of federation can really vary how, how, how powerful the uh, 
unifying government is and what, what its roles and responsibilities are can vary in different circumstances. So in his view, the view that he's articulating here, states would continue to have autonomy, they would continue to function in a lot of independent ways, they would have a lot of their own political power, but they would cede certain kinds of responsibilities to the international level. One of those responsibilities had to do with international human rights. Uh, and so we'll talk more about those, I guess, in the next session, the international human rights aspect. But the premise is that rights would be something that the world would agree on and that nobody in any state and no state itself uh, would be above those, the commandments of the rights. So that that would hold everyone to account and kind of keep things operating uh, in a sort of fair and just manner. Um, and here there are questions about uh, the justiciability of different kinds of rights. Um, we'll talk more about that in the last session as opposed to this one. Um, but it, he sort of puts on the table, the, the chapter puts on the table the difference, the distinction between different kinds of rights. In the Indian context, this is the distinction between fundamental rights and directive principles. Um, and directive principles are aspirations as opposed to um, mandates that can you can seek recourse from through courts. Um, and there's some debate about that. I pushed that conversation off to the last one. Um, that's where we would just really focus on human rights and justiciability and where we go with those things. That's our last session. For this one, I think uh, the question ultimately for us, uh, which I'll leave you with now, is... Uh, what is the place of the ideal in a real world um, that is filled with violence? And I think in the last class, last, last class, the last session, sorry, um, in, in the last session that I uh, indicated to you with Gandhi a little bit that um, th there's a bit of a mistake with him in, in sort of seeing him as oh, he's, he, he sort of has this pie in the sky attitude. He's, he believes in nonviolence and la-di-da and how do you, you know, that's not real. But in fact, Gandhi's nonviolence is, is, is situated in an understanding of a world that is saturated in violence. He, he understands that violence is the norm. Uh, and similarly, um, the ideals in which, the ideals which Nehru and his peers are advocating uh, throughout the book, and then in this chapter in particular, also are 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 uh, done so in a world saturated with uh, uh, many different kinds of visions, some of which are violent, and some which might be categorized by more fierce moral kinds of judgments. So I'm one minute over. Um, I'll stop here, and we can uh, discuss it at your discretion. I actually wanted to say, Manu, that we, we started just a few minutes late. So if you have any other thoughts that you'd like to round out now prior to the discussion, if there was anything else on your mind you'd like to bring up in anticipation of the discussion, go for it now. Uh, no, I'm, I'm good. We can we can start. I mean, you know, as you saw the last time, we can go in different directions in the discussion and we cut off some people the last time. So I'd rather just make sure that everyone has a chance to ask whatever they want. Very good. OK, so um, if anybody would like to kick us off with questions. Please raise your physical hand or your virtual hand. Gail, would you like to start us off? Um, I guess I'm I'm muted. Um, yeah, I think that um, Gandhi, I mean, Nehru's concept of intersectionality between the um, goals of an independent um, India and of World Federation is a key concept. You know, he said, in essence, in order to fully achieve what we are uh, trying to um, attain in India, we need to have a world federation. And um, there were principles from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that were embedded in um, many countries under their individual um, constitutions in, in the US and elsewhere. I'm wondering if this could be a strategy that uh, would be useful to promote World Federation to say, well, I remember Rebecca said at one in, in one um, interview that she didn't look at, um, you know, our if a, if a country is to join a World Federation, it, it wouldn't be losing something, but rather gaining something. Um, I wonder if we could, um, you know, have a strategy of going kind of country by country 
you know, what are you trying to achieve, achieve in terms of human rights and um, economic um, situation and others that could be helped uh, through global cooperation in a world federation? I'm wondering what you think of that as a, um, a practical strategy. I mean, the other approach would be, you know, a so-called idealistic one, um, you know, of of the Gandhi and and, um, and Nehru were statesmen in that they looked at the world as a whole, not just as their own nation. And that would be another approach. But I think there's an intersection of that too, in that the idealists understand that, um, you know, there is an intersection between the the individual and the and the whole. Whereas others that are nationalistic don't understand that. Anyhow, I'm wondering what you what you think about my um, my idea. Thank you, Gail. Uh, Manu, just a question. Would you like to answer that now, or should we go through a run of questions and then talk talk about them in some? I think we have enough time. So, and also this is a complicated question. So, I think I'll take them one by one, and okay. then if they feel if I feel like they're questions that should group together, we can take two or three at a time. But this one, I think, is complicated enough. Uh, so let me let me just sort of jump into a couple of things. Um, the first, I think, thing that's important to recognize, the two aspects to this, is the distinction between the time in which Nehru and Gandhi were operating and our own time. We live in a much more cynical time, for one thing. We also live in a, in a sense, in a much more, tra quote, transparent time. You know, the, the media uh, in the days of Gandhi, Nehru, FDR, uh, were they followed certain certain kinds of rules with public figures, and they would not necessarily report on every single detail. Or they weren't privy to it in some cases, or even if they were, they wouldn't necessarily put it out there for the public. Um, that is totally not true anymore. Where basically every anything is fair game, and everything is sort of. Um, uh, talked about. One of the reasons why this is significant is Gandhi, as as I think we mentioned in the last class, and sorry, doing that. Uh, uh, it's this point in the semester in which I can't help myself because so I'm doing in, in, in my in my actual courses. Um, uh, in, the, in the last session, um, you know, we, we talked about the fact that Gandhi was a human being and he made mistakes. And some of the mistakes he made were really bad ones. Um, there were mistakes in judgment, and he also had mistakes in character. He, he did he did some bad things. He said some bad things. Uh, and if someone like him made mistakes, you can only imagine what everyone else did. Like, you know, lots of people make mistakes and did bad things. And we should hold them to account for it, too, uh, which we're doing now, but really hadn't been done in its day. So the point of this, though, is if today you find idealistic people or politicians, um, in many ways, they're just way more hemmed in. We know a lot more, we pay attention a lot more, and we've got all kinds of sources trying to dig up things in all kinds of ways. People are a lot less forgiving of the ambiguities and the, and the uh, hypocrisies which arise from people wielding power and saying one thing and doing another. Um, some of this is, well, they should, and on the other hand, it's the world is, in a sense, more complicated than ever. So there's, yes, there's a handful of idealistic politicians today who might be able to say this, that, or the other thing. I can think of one from New Zealand, for example, who isn't in power anymore, but who for a period of time was put on a certain kind of pedestal. Um, but I, I, overall, they're few and far between. They're hard to find, and people are always looking for ways to bring them down. And there are ways to bring them down because they're human and they're making mistakes. So I think relying on that kind of a thing, the idea of having idealistic political figures uh, be our champ, be champions of these kinds of goals can be hard. On the other hand, we can't do it without them. So you have to find the right balance um, between the role that they can play and the, and the advocacy that's needed for moving various kinds of goals forward. And relying on celebrities is probably equally fraught. So that's where this gets a little challenging. Uh, but overall, I mean, I think, uh, um, uh, Gail, the other part of your question is, is, a, is a really astute one, which is the, you know, uh, I think the big 
the big overall question that the what the, my book my work shows is that there really was and others as well there was really a period of time at which there was kind of a real enthusiasm for um essentially world government it, it, it wasn't something that people blanched away from talking about people talked about okay maybe they talked about it euphemistically one world or world federation whatever it is but there was a time at which it was quite a popular idea uh, and people talked openly about it and it wasn't it wasn't thought of as kooky and it wasn't talked about as uh um in, in any kind of bad sense and and then something happens that isn't true anymore. It's certainly not true anymore, but there's a period at which the idea becomes heavily criticized. We don't have to think very far back to it. We know some of the famous kinds of like mm, conspiratorial criticisms of it, the uh, the men in black, the black helicopters, uh, the vilification of the UN, all of this stuff sort of starts to circulate, circulate around the world. And, and this gets relegated to a whole different kind of um, uh, realm of ideas. So uh, confronting that, um, I think top-down approaches to, to pushing the idea of, well, we need to federate, we need to do this, we need to do that, you know, that it can be challenging. Now, uh, it can be challenging because, you know, you have to move the needle between where masses of people have this now different, very understanding of what world government or world federation or federating principles mean. On the other hand, you have all these sort of mm, smaller subsets of things which are part of the larger cause, like creating an international criminal court uh, or put, or the Maastricht Treaty, creating the ultimately creating the European Union. Um, and so these kinds of federating principles can be useful. There's critics of those things, of course. The European Union is more about capital, less about uh, and, and finance, less about people um, and there is people movement but it's less about uh, focusing in on broader principles so so i mean i think those are some of the things we would want to consider which brings us to this last point uh, which is what's the role of working with individual states to push uh, certain kinds of principles within them which then tie them to like larger international values uh, and then that can lay the foundation to this other thing. Well, one, I think, strategic point to take away from this, which I think um, various advocates can sometimes lose sight of, is the importance of making people feel like they have buy-in, which is to say that the, the importance of allowing different communities to find their own histories their own ideas, their own values uh, reflected in whatever these kinds of concepts are. So in other words, instead of trying to trace uh, principles of human rights or things like freedom of speech, always only to um, things like the European Enlightenment, the French Revolution, the American Revolution, uh, things of that sort, uh, I I think it's it's completely okay, and it is not wrong to say, look, I can go back in my in this place, and I see that we had this kind of thing, and in this village three thousand years ago, and that was a tradition that sort of kept alive this way, and so what we see here is that the origins of free speech can lie this way in this local community. Okay. What's wrong with that? Um, like they they want to they want to create and 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 track this kind of origin. It's an it doesn't take away from the importance of uh, whatever American constitutionalism um, or um, French Republican values or Napoleon spreading uh, certain kinds of principles around the world. Um, but it, it the dialogic process of these things can still be acknowledged. Um, these alternate trajectories allow people buy-in and it feels less imposed. And the idea of imposition is really the key. The more people feel like outsiders are trying to impose something on them, the more people will resist 
by definition. The more they have to feel like they're part of the conversation, they're part of the process, it's coming from them, and that they're equal contributors. Uh, and so, I mean, I think this is the essential takeaway. And I think, therefore, when you work with the other thing that people fear is losses of losses of those traditions, values, principles, and freedoms. So to talk about things like World Federation or Feder you know, broader principles has to be couched in a way where the only things that are to be lost are values like discrimination, oppression, um, uh, you know, extreme inequality. The more we focus on like the, the elimination of those things while accepting that there's going to be divergences in practices based on heritage and value, you know, certain kinds of values. And we'll talk more about that in the last session because that's what the last session is really about. I think there's a value to that. So sorry, very long-winded answer. Uh, there were, that was a complicated question. That's why, um, uh, James, I, I really wanted to just take the question directly, but there were three parts to it and I wanted to make sure I got through all of them. Okay, so if it's okay, we'll start with uh, David and then go to uh, Carla and then to Bruce. David, would you like to comment on this? Much of what you uh, wrote about in this chapter and said this morning, uh, really is about a two-state solution between Pakistan and India. And of course, that would remind all of us of the current situation of a two-state solution between Israel and Palestine. I'm wondering if you think that there are similarities between the two situations and what might be the differences. I'm also wondering about how Kashmir see, still seems to be an unresolved issue between India and Pakistan and maybe the entire Punjab region involving the Sikhs. So um, just wondering if you have any thoughts on those issues. Well, there's no shying away from controversy in this session. Let's, let's say that. <laughs> uh, okay. Let's start with Kashmir, I guess. Uh, uh, it's a good thing to start with because I think we'll find that, um, you know, Ka Kashmir is a problem all the way through. And one of the things the book talks about is the fact that Kashmir is a problem even for Nehru, I mean, right? That Nehru has a problem trying to figure out a way forward without his beloved Kashmir. And so uh, the book, the chapter mentions how this becomes a thing. So in a sense, it's great to start with that because what it really tells us is that really there's no one, no place, not a person, but no place that's above these kinds of kinds of issues that there's always that's that sort of the exception, the state of exception or the or the problem in their particular zone or or whatever. And so wherever we go, some place has similar kinds of things going on. Um, and what that means is that no one, nowhere, anywhere can really get up on a pedestal and say, well, we're not like that. We haven't done it. Mm -hmm, not really. For the most part, anyway. I mean, I'd be surprised. Maybe there's some small, local, whatever. Okay, but that's not the... We're talking big especially big, prominent, powerful places, countries, large entities. The larger the entity, the more likely you might face these things. Now, this also raises a particular issue, which is contra-federation. What happens when, despite all best efforts and intentions, there really is a community of people who just don't want to be part of it for any, any kind of explanation? What do you do? In which case, forceful federation can be oppression. Uh, and so you got to come up with, um, you know, real um, understandings of this kind of thing. And, and this, by the way, is not all that far removed, as integrated as we might think of the United Kingdom barring um, Northern Ireland. Mm, my understanding, anyway, is that there is real resentment in places like Scotland and um, parts of Wales. Uh, and, and so... You never really know. Uh, I mean, the breakup of the United United Kingdom seems unfathomable to us, to me anyway. Uh, but I'm, you know, sometimes I meet people for whom th that isn't unfathomable. 
that, that they're really not uh, all that uh, all that committed uh, to that particular principle. Uh, obviously, um, you know, for for some, I guess, for all of us, um, you know, Yugoslavia was a thing, uh, and now it isn't a thing. Um, and uh, how much further it might not be a thing is another is another uh, point of discussion. Yugoslavia, of course, they're a product of a federating movement, a movement to bring people together, uh, and then ultimately that it couldn't hold together. So I think all of these points is to say that um, we need to be careful about thinking about any of these things as the definitive answer or solution. Um, and I also don't think that we, uh, we all, I think we also have to be very careful about assuming that any solution, let I me mean, be careful with language here, any, uh, any solution that is advocated is the definitive one. This is the one that people will accept and then the case is closed and never again to be reopened. I mean, I, I think we have to live with the idea that anything can be reopened by anyone at any time and sometimes it is. Um, so we wanna keep all of that in mind. Uh, and I, I uh, uh, say all that as a preface. Okay, now Ka <laughs> is Kashmir still a problem? Kashmir is still a problem and it isn't just between India and Pakistan. I mean, that's one aspect, but it's also about the lives of everyday Kashmiris um, who are living with uh, violence uh, imposed uh, by um, uh, uh, by a state um, in the in, on the Indian side and then on the Pakistani side because the Pakistani side is also very keen on disrupting the Indian side and they place you know they sort of place high value on infiltrators and things like that in order to be able to pursue that per policy of infiltration the people who suffer through all of this are the innocent Kashmiris every day now the Indian side also had a special uh, I don't know how deep you want me to go into this but they had a special article in the constitution that was very relevant and they got rid of that very recently that that allows for a different approach to the state from by India and um, in essence, this has allowed also for the abrogation of rights of Kashmiris and or that went hand in hand with this, the elimination of this article in the constitution. All of this is to say that it remains a problem and the people who suffer the most from it are Kashmiris. Um, uh, and, um, but Kashmir isn't the only kind of Fisher point, as you also said, there's also uh, Punjab and Sikhs. Let's be clear here that in truth, there probably aren't very many separatist kinds of movements or or people particularly paying attention to what's called loosely Khalistan. Um, but I don't know if you've been following it. It has become a point of contention between India and Canada because a separatist Sikh, someone who loosely was considered a separatist Sikh leader was found killed and found dead. And Canada made the claim that Indian agencies killed him on Canadian soil. And this has created a big political brouhaha, um, and they're you know sort of fighting about that. Uh, and then whatever the point of all of that is, that has brought this issue back into sort of a national, international spotlight as people are discussing Israel and Palestine. I mean, I don't know if it's fair to ask me to kind of think about or talk about this kind of most complex issue in the whole world in the context of forty-five minute discussion. Um, I will say. Uh, I, so I, I don't know about saying a two-state solution is the answer or this, that, or the other thing, um, because it can come off in a way, in particular, in a way that I don't want it to come off, which is, which is um, uh, without seriousness of thought and purpose. You know, I, I don't want to give a, a a loose answer to something that really requires. Um, um, prudent thought uh, and action. Um, what I would say is that there have been a variety of solutions put forward, um, which haven't ever really gained much traction. I would also say that there are um, advocates of, two, of a two-state solution, of a one-state solution, uh, of various things, and that in various kinds of contexts, the arguments for these things can be persuasive. I, I would say that whatever the situation, whatever the, the real answer might be here, the current situation, I hope we can agree, everyone can agree, is untenable. Um, 
Uh, and so some path forward needs to be found. Um, one would hope that it, the people on the ground would realize this and find their way forward on their own. Um, but we can also say that it isn't the situation, it isn't the case where this is two groups of people on their own who can't agree. This is an international conflict. It, it, uh, there, are, there are all kinds of agreements, movements of weapons, movements of money, uh, which integrate uh, the two um, um, sides of the conflict. Uh, into larger international um, concerns, actions, and the affairs of other states. So I think that um, we have, on that, for that reason alone, you can't say that this is a, um, an internal conflict to Israel. You can't say that it's a bilateral conflict between. Israel and Palestine, it is by definition an international issue. And so the international community does need to play a role one way or the other uh, in, in, in sort of mitigating the conflict and, 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 and coming up with a more workable thing. Um, finally, I would say um, about this that um, in the broadest sense, I think the recent events help to underscore the real dangers of having um, right-wing authoritarian figures not committed to principles of democracy. Here, I hope, don't misunderstand me. I mean, I would say this would be true of lots of different actors on the stage, including people in the, in, involved in this conflict. I'm not singling anyone out here, but the dangers of having them pull the levers of power. They aren't committed to principles of democracy. They aren't committed to principles of transparency. They are committed to kind of their grip on power and they're willing to do anything uh, to, to push that kind of thing forward. And under with all of that in combination, the result almost always is catastrophic and very dangerous not only to them, to the whoever they perceive as their enemies, but to them, to the people that they are that they are uh, running. So um, the fear I have is that this is one example, but it's connected to so many other places and states with similar kinds of issues. And so we also want to be cautious about the fact that this is perhaps only the first domino, or maybe the second domino, and we don't want it to trigger something even worse. Uh, so. There's a lot going on. Uh, I think I'll leave it there. I'm happy to talk about it in a more substantive way, but I'm not sure this is the forum to do that. And I also want to be clear that I'm not really an expert. Oh, lastly, I would say Israel and Palestine, by the way, is something that India did deal with uh, and that um, the Indian leadership had uh, thoughts on. Uh, um, that's something historically we could talk about and their approach to it. And it is something that I do deal with a little bit in my new book too. Um, but but um, I, I, I would end by saying that mm -hmm. I think the only way forward is for a group, uh, someone with enough credibility and integrity and trustworthiness to try to forge uh, a, a new path um, and to and to work together uh, to come up with a lasting peaceful solution. Um, unfortunately, whoever that might be or whatever that might be requires the willingness of the representatives of both sides to come to the table and to come up with that solution. If that isn't there, it doesn't matter who you bring in to try to do the negotiations. It won't work because they'll be undermined or torpedoed by one or the other side. So those two sides, first and foremost, have to be willing willing to come up with that answer and accept it. That's it. Thank you, Manu. Yet another long answer. Yeah. Um, Carla, would you like to go next? Yes. Thank you, Manu. I, I, I'm going to be on the same trajectory. I, but I want to go back to something you presented to us and just push on it a little. 
you spoke of that early idea of the Muslims and the, Hin the, the, the what they called Pakistan and Hindustan, and that it would mean the vision of Hindus living in Pakistan and Islamics living in Hind Hindustan. It is there that, that there is an unaddressed issue that is so basic that it deals not only with India, but it deals with the Israeli-Palestinian uh, uh, question. And that is the unsolved declaration of what is sovereign. If the borders are sovereign, you've got one catastrophe. If the person is sovereign, everything is possible. That is not settled. And I add to your old closing comments to David that not only a person or the two sides have to deal with that question before they can solve anything. And that's where I think the two situations are very highly related. But that question of sovereignty has to be settled. And it could be the key for for what be what uh, whatever you want to call a one state or two state solution, but I I would say one state that you have in in your situation India, with both uh, a Pakistan and a Hindustan that forms a unity. But that's only possible, I think, with that that other question. I'd be glad for your comments. Um, well, I, I, the the idea of this um, uh, Hindustan and Pakistan forming India was Jinnah's vision. I don't think that that is a viable one anymore, but I do think, not in that form anyway, but I do think that there have been efforts for quite some time to try to forge regional alliances. Um, you know, in India and Pakistan would form kind of a, a, a their own, along with Bangladesh, uh, Nepal and Sri Lanka, they have, you know, sort of security arrangements or free trade zones. Uh, you know, a lot of these things have been put forward as possible ways of, 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 of creating mm, larger than organizations. Um, and hasn't, I mean, they're there, some of them are there in, in fact, in, um, in fact, but not really in practice, like they don't, they, they just don't have much traction or, or, or power, and so in some cases they do say or issue statements or whatever. But um, right now that's still very loose, and I think ultimately until India and Pakistan can kind of come to some kind of viable agreement uh, of a lasting peace, okay, this other stuff is still very hard to to sort of talk about or think about. Um, on on, the, on one other issue here is that um, Pakistan and Hindustan in the original vision was about parity. And for all kinds of reasons, we don't have that now. India is much larger. It's it's uh, economically way more powerful uh, and there's a huge imbalance. And so I don't think that that kind of thing anymore would work from anyone's point of view. Um, so I, I think you have to think about it as kind of regional um, alliances or beyond alliances, like a regional organization network uh, as, as something that might work. Um, and then in terms of contested notions of sovereignty, I mean, I, it would be nice if people agree, but I don't think people agree. I think there's ambiguity in the concept of sovereignty. It's not just personal or, or borders. You know, there's parliamentary sovereignty uh, in, in democracies where the notion of sovereignty lies can, can be ambiguous, can be contested, can be housed in different places at different times. Uh, uh, and so I think that we it's difficult to, again, come up with a single answer. I think you put your finger on the point, which is that um, contested notions of sovereignty are often the issue. So how do we find the right balance? And I'd say maybe it's okay if the balance is different from place to place. So you have to figure that out uh, but with what works here. Thank you, Manu. Uh, Bruce, would you like to step in? Next, with your question or comment. Sure. I'm going to try to squeeze in two questions real quick. Um, the first is, is the Congress party dead? Is it, or, or is, will it come back into power? I mean, what are the political dynamics of India as you see it? 
The other is this conversation that we're having about countries splitting apart and countries, you know, coalescing together. You see the European Union, uh, which is a remarkable uh, thing and, and uh, you know, uh, an example that others can follow. I, I know the Scots quite well, and Scottish independence is a real thing. Uh, and I even think the United States does is not going to be one nation for very much longer. I think we're going to split up at some point because we have such um, divisions. Will India split up? Uh, will, the, will there be pieces of India that will just, you know, not tolerate being part of the of the entire? So those are my two questions: Congress Party and the the future of a united India. Uh, this is a tough crowd today. This is this is these are, these are you're asking really challenging questions. Um, okay, let's see. Congress, the Congress Party in in India. Um, okay, first of all, um, it the head the okay. I'm gonna answer this question. The, the party has a leadership infrastructure. It also has connections to India's first family. That's the descendants of Nehru. Um, Nehru's daughter was Indira Gandhi. Indira Gandhi's son was Rajiv Gandhi. These two were prime ministers. No one has been prime minister from the family after Rajiv Gandhi. That was the last of the lineage. So there were three prime ministers in the family. But the party, the family itself is into. Uh, is intricately intertwined with the Congress. Many people associate the two things with one another, and they often say that the family runs the party, you know, in a very firm fashion. Um, I don't know that it's entirely unfair or criticism. I mean, I think the party continues, I mean, the family continues to play a role in the party. That's true. Um, but, you know, I mean, families play roles. Uh, they, haven't, uh, they haven't assumed direct power. Uh, that also is a charge for criticism because when they don't hold direct power, then they're not held accountable because you're they're sort of pulling strings from behind the scenes. Now, anyway, that's a that's a different kind of a thing. I mention all of that to say that the current scion of the party of of the family, uh, Rahul Gandhi, uh, just did this thing called the Bharat Jodo Yatra, which which was a march across all of India from the southern tip to the to the northernmost tip of Kashmir. He sort of walked the whole of the country in an act that was reminiscent, obviously, of Mahatma Gandhi, um, except Mahatma Gandhi's most famous such march was his salt march to the sea, um, where he marched, uh, you know, something like two, something round about 200 odd mile, a little over 200 odd miles uh, over the course of a month. Uh, this was 10 times that. Uh, this is the entire length of the country. Uh, so it was a significant act. And uh, there was a media blackout about it for the most part. It wasn't really talked about in the media, but it did, apparently, it has captured the attention of a lot of people on the ground. And uh, um, studies and polling and conversations that have happened subsequently show a, a real uh, interest in him and in the party because of this particular thing it made a real connection um and that's something that um, the current prime minister uh, mr modi ha he has a very different skill set uh he's a he, he's he he's great at the podium can be very theatrical and uh has a you know a, a certain kind of oratorical prowess uh, but it's a, it's definitely removed. He isn't a very intimate kind of person. He doesn't engage. In, everything is very staged and choreographed with him. Uh, and that has served him very well. But what I think uh, is happening now is there's a, there's a, a real choice and a, a competition between that kind of politics and the old fashioned tactile on the ground movement politics, which I think the Congress has been trying more recently. In addition to that, they just formed an alliance with a range of other parties. They called this alliance, guess what, India as an acronym. And so the whole 
thing I mentioned, which is this competition between calling uh, this, this challenge by the current government to no longer call the country India and to call it Bharat instead, is really about this. They're trying to take away the political cachet of the opposition alliance calling itself India. Uh, and there's, they're trying to I, act like the idea of India, the name India is a British imposition, which of course is nonsense. The, the name India has been in circulation for thousands of years. So that that is uh, is not is not um, uh, it, that that particular claim is not that's not accurate. At any rate, um, uh, there was an election held uh, in a southern state, and the Congress stomped to victory. They destroyed the opposition and and wound up with an outright majority. Uh, on their own. It's big, really big victory. So is the Congress dead? I don't, I don't think so. Uh, but I don't, that doesn't necessarily mean it might come back to power anytime soon. Um, it might win a few states. Maybe it would come to, we, we don't know is the short answer. Uh, it's very hard to tell right now because um, there's a, there can be a real difference between polls and this on the ground stuff. People, there's a lot, there's a lot of fear in the country of responding Honestly, um, and so uh, I would. The takeaway is, I don't think the Congress is dead. In in the sense that that's the end of the Congress forever. Uh, I think that it has a pathway back, um, and it might win a few more victories. It may come back to power. I don't know when any of this would be true. I mean, it may be in the next six months to a year, it might not be for another 10 years. Uh, but that's how I would sort of look at it, is my guess. That's a guess. An informed guess. Um, the, um, well, with caveats, it's difficult to tell because uh, once again, one has to believe that there is a, a enduring commitment to democracy. Uh, if one side begins to dismantle um, the elements and infrastructure of democracy, then one never knows what can happen or what what the result of that would be or, or where things would go. And um, there have been definitely some worrying trends over um, in over recent in recent times, uh, and we don't know where that's going to go. Uh, and so, if that stuff moves in the wrong direction, all bets are off as to what can happen. Would India break up? Uh, I think, I mean, I don't think that there's a definitive answer to that. I would say, as far as I know, uh, there's a commitment by all sides, across all parties, across the entire political spectrum, any national level party at any rate, uh, or anyone with national aspirations uh, against any such thing. And anyone who didn't commit themselves to the, to the unity of India uh, would, uh, would find themselves in a bad position. In fact, the ruling party right now makes it a point and, and their acolytes on uh, uh, television anchors who subscribe to their views or, or like party affiliates, uh, they make a, they, they, they try to label any opposition figure as someone interested in the breakup of India as a means to sort of dismiss their point of view. The point of that is to say that breakup of India is considered a bad thing, uh, and it does have a lot of political traction in the country, uh, and that basically everyone across the spectrum, including the all members of the opposition, do not subscribe to the breakup of India. So I, I, I would find it hard to imagine that anything like that would occur without uh, a very fierce pushback from the center uh, and with a, a lot of support nationally from the population. Um, the only places, I mean, obviously there are, fring, there are borders and fringe areas where there have been issues. Um, I don't really think that there are any issues in the South anymore. Uh, the places where they're continuing, Assam, for example, or the Northeast, some of these places which previously may have had some kinds of questions, I don't think those things are there. Uh, anymore. Um, so the areas where it's, and I don't think there's any substantive Sikh separatist movement, as I already said, in Punjab. So the only place that really remains contested is Kashmir. Um, and to the extent that there's anything else is in these border territories in disputes with China, 
Um, and so I would be, I think, honestly, I'd be hard, but there are these uh, tribal movements, uh, but that isn't really about breakup. That's more about like getting the state off their back and things like that. So there's a, you know, there, there's a, there's a, uh, I would find it surprising, I think, uh, where things are now for anything substantive to occur uh, along the lines of what you're talking about. In fact, I would say that the United Kingdom, or frankly, the European Union are in much greater danger of breaking up than India is. Thank you, Manu. Everyone for your questions. Um, we've come to the end of our allotted time. I would just like to ask if anybody has any other business they'd like to relay to the rest of Book Club prior to ending the session. Hands up, please. Gail. And Melanie, are you? Yep, okay. Gail, would you like to go first and then we'll go to Melanie. I just want to remind people that the next session will be the second Sunday, a uh, second Saturday of December, which fits our format, is the second Saturday of each month from noon to 1.30 Eastern time. And at that time, we will be wrapping up this book with um, Manu, The Peacemakers. We'll finish the book with chapter six and the epilogue. So join us for the, the grand finale. Um, We'll have a session after that just with participants to discuss among ourselves the ideas from the book. So please put it on your calendars. Thank you, Gail. Uh, Melanie just posted in the comments. Um, would you just like to give a quick rundown of, of what you've posted? Yes, Mike. First, I want to say, Manu, uh, thank you for your intelligent, thoughtful, um, very uh, peaceful uh, answers to these very complicated questions and really appreciate this. this is so informative and so interesting. Uh, thank you. Um, so yes, we have lots going on. If you uh, could please save this chat. Um, we're going to be talking with Dr. Rion Eisler, amazing person, partnership, Chalice in the Blade. I'm, I'm sure you've heard of her and we've had her on the podcast before, but she's going to be talking about the movie Barbie and how, you know, she's a system scientist. So how we can make these systems change? Why, why do they keep building and going the same way? And, you know, that type of things. Fantastic. We're going to be going to the States Party, second meeting of the States Party. Uh, the the countries that are ha are saying no to nuclear weapons and have banned nuclear weapons. We're going to be promoting the the movie television event that we hope will convince people who have not decided that nuclear weapons are bad. You know, help them. These politicians say yes, we'll sign the ban. We're going to be doing that. You can watch the trailer. You can watch the film television event now. Absolutely now, but there's going to be an amazing screening where the film, the day after was shot, the film, okay, the television event is a film about the day after film, which was uh, uh, integral in getting Reagan's mind to change and saving us, bringing us back from the brink. So uh, the last thing is we're going to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So we're looking forward to having a great time. That will be on December 6th rather than the 10th. So thank you. Okay, many thanks to Melanie. Many thanks to Gail for the update for the next session. Many thanks to all of you for your questions. A fascinating session again. That brings us to a close. Um, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you, everybody.